Hey, today I'm going to show you the fastest way to integrate Jupyter into your app. We'll do this with the Jupyter terminal. It is super simple and you can even put it into a plain HTML file. Next, we're going to use the create Solana dApp CLI to build a Next.js application and we'll put the terminal into that. Once we're done with that, we're going to use the Jupyter API to create our own swap interface and you can customize this to however you like. Alongside all of this, I'm going to talk about the approach that I take to building these apps and how I actually learn. So I'll talk about the problems that I face and how I solve them. So there's not going to be a lot of watching me code, but instead I'll just be sharing my, sharing my approach. The idea here is to teach you how to fish instead of giving you the code for the fish. Let's get started. The first thing you need is an idea you're excited about. For me, that was an app that uses the Jupyter API. This is a really useful API and also Jupyter just cool. The question first I asked is, hey, can I just fork this? Does it already exist? So I did a GitHub search for Jupyter Swap. I found a bunch of results, but none of these are a front end. So I decided, okay, I can just make this. Next, I asked Perplexity. Hey, Perplexity, I want to use the Jupyter API. How do I do this? So Perplexity is a search engine that's AI enabled. You can ask it questions and it actually understands them. So the exact question I asked was, hey, I want to build a web app with the Jupyter API. Are there any templates? I have any open source repos? What's the fastest way to get set up with it? So Perplexity understands this question and it gives me an answer. Perplexity is free, by the way, you can use it. Uh, it doesn't always work, but with questions that are understandable, it is a decent job. Perplexity told me the fastest way to get started was with the Jupyter terminal. The terminal is a super light version of Jupyter that you can add into your app by just linking it to the HTML. I decided to use this before diving all the way into the API because it would help me understand how Jupyter works and it wouldn't take a lot of time to set up. Plus, it's a really handy tool to have in your tool belt so you can add it into future apps if you want to. I found the docs. I got the code that I could copy and paste. So that's what I did. I made an HTML page. I added the code from the docs and it did not work. <laughs> Let me dive into the HTML and show you how I got it to work. Here's an HTML file with all the code the docs want you to add. I've got a script tag that brings in the JavaScript for the terminal. I've got a div with the Jupyter terminal ID, and I've got a bit of JavaScript that puts these two together and it initializes the Jupyter terminal at this div. If you load this in your browser, it will not work. It's gonna say, cannot read properties of undefined. What's happening here is this code is running before this code is fully loaded. Even though I have data preload and defer, it's not working. So what do you do? You can add a listener over here which is exactly what I'm going to do. I added a DOM content uh, content loaded listener. So this code is only going to run when all of this has been loaded. What happens next? You get another error. It's saying document.element.id cannot find object Jupyter terminal. So now this code is running before this is loaded. Even though I've got DOM content loaded, that's JavaScript for you. So what I did here is I just cheated. I said, nah, I don't want, I don't want to bother with this. And I added an extra bit of code that creates this div. So error number one solved. Error number two, also solved. And there we go, we have our terminal. You will need to add an RPC here. So the endpoint can be for whatever RPC you want. I'm going with Helios because the founder is bald and I believe in bald founders. But that's it, you've got a full on Jupyter terminal set up that you can actually interact with. Next up, we're gonna do the exact same thing in Next.js. I'm gonna use the create Solana dApp CLI. This is the recommended template tool on Solana at the moment for making apps. So that's what I use. You can do npx create Solana dApp at latest and this will set up everything you need. We're gonna go with Jupyter swap two as the name, I think one's already token. Now you can do it either Next.js or React. I want Next.js, that's what I'm going with. I'm not gonna use Tailwind because it can be a bit overwhelming. So for a beginner friendly tutorial, I'm not gonna use uh, Tailwind. Uh, I'm not going to set up an anchor template. So anchor is a framework for building Solana programs. We're not going to be building a program because we're interacting with Jupyter. So we're just going to do this with anchor template is ready. Open it up, hit NPM I and spend a bit of time getting familiar with it. When you're using a template, it might be doing things differently than you're used to, or it might be using a framework that you haven't used before. I hadn't used the Next.js app router in a while and I had forgotten the relationship between uh, page.tsx and layout.tsx. I forgot how these things work together. So I spent a bit of time talking to ChatGPT and even reading the Next.js docs to figure out how these worked. And for a bit, my focus was just printing out the wallet address over here. That's, that was like my entire focus for the first one hour. Sometimes what happens with developers and even myself is we'll notice I don't know what's happening here and that'll turn into I'm supposed to know what this is. Oh man, I can't do this and you'll give up. No, just lower your expectations. You can do this, set smaller goals. If you haven't worked with a template or you haven't worked with 
a framework before, you're not going to be able to figure it out on first go. So what you, what's happening is you're overestimating how much you need to know and you're underestimating how fast you'll figure it out. Now, let me show you how you can put the Jupyter terminal in there ASAP. This template is a standard Next.js app router application with all of the common Solana libraries such as Web3.js and Wallet Adapter installed. All of your pages are wrapped in the cluster provider and Solana provider. So these will share the state of the connected wallet and the connected network to all sub pages. So page.tsx, that is children right here. So if I change something on page.tsx, let's say, hello, YouTube. And if I go right here, if I refer, oh, there you go, automatically refreshed. So this right here, this is where page.tsx is. And this over here at the top with the connected wallet, this is liat.tsx. So any pages you make will have the wallet state connected. Before we can bring in the Jupyter terminal code, we will need to bring in the types. So under the web folder, make a new folder called types. And in the types folder, make a file called Jupyter dot d dot ts. The types are available on the Jupyter documentation. So just open this file up, copy, Give it a big old paste and you are good to go. I'm going to bring in the code for these scripts and we're going to walk you through it. So I'm going to comment, just nuke these for a little bit. All right. So starting off, we've got use client. This is a server side rendered application and we want it to render this page on the client. So we've got use client at the top. We've got a few standard React imports. And then for the JSX, it's just one div with the ID integrated terminal. Launch Jupyter, this is exactly what you saw in the HTML. This is a bit of JavaScript that will initialize the Jupyter terminal. I've got a few extra um, configuration items over here, which is why it's a bit longer. And I've also got my API key. Please don't steal this, be nice to me. And that's really it. Now, for the actual loading part of the script, there's multiple ways you can do this. You could, for instance, have a header tag over here. So you could add under the HTML, you could add a head tag uh, and you could put the script in here. That will not work. There's also an official Next.js script tag. I've tried that one as well, but that also did not work. In the end, I ended up just using a use effect. So what I've got is a use effect. And in this use effect, I am creating a script element and I'm loading in the script. So script.source and once that's loaded in, I am uh, initializing the launch Jupyter function. And this will give you a very pretty Jupyter swap terminal in React uh, with your wallet connected. And this is actually on mainnet. I have configured this to be on mainnet. So the RPC you use over here, where is this? The RPC you use over here. So if you use a DevNet RPC, this will configure to the uh, DevNet. But since I've got mainnet over here, it's giving me actual real life mainnet money. And apparently I have 37 buck. Now let's do this with the API. So the swap API only has two endpoints code and swap code takes in the input and out moments along with the amount and it tells you how much you're going to get back if that's good you can use that code response along with the user's public key to the swap endpoint which gives you a transaction that you can sign to complete the swap to get started i'm just going to hard code all of this to make sure the the code for the code and the swap works once i have that working then i'm going to add ui that configures the input and output mints and as well as the amount I'm going to give swap its own page. So to make a new route, you add a new folder under the app directory. We're going to call this swap and inside swap, I'm going to make page.tsx and in page.tsx, I'm going to paste a bunch of uh, boilerplate. So this is from the Jupyter docs. So if you go to the Jupyter docs, it's going to tell you exactly what you need. However, one issue here is this is for a Node.js script. It says in your command line terminal, install these libraries and make a Jupyter API example.js file. We are not running this in Node, we're running this in the browser. So we're going to have to change a few things. Let me bring the rest of the code in here and I'll walk you through what we need to change. The first thing you are making is using a browser wallet instead. The script that they have in their docs uses a key pair that they're generating. We're not going to do that because we want the user to sign this. Next, we're going to change the format of the URL. They're using backspaces to format the URL butter. This is not going to work in the browser. So we're just going to change this to just be all one line. I have this, uh, I have line wrapping turned on. So if I turn that off, you can see it's a really long URL. Next, we are changing the way we are signing the transaction. Instead of signing with a key pair, we're signing with wallet.sign transaction. And finally, we're updating the way we're handling the transaction confirmation. The way they're doing it is a bit outdated. So if you actually post this code, where is this code? So if you do await connection.confirm transaction, this will show you a deprecation error. So it's going to tell you, hey, this has been deprecated. Please give me a uh, strategy instead. So we're updated this. I know how to do this uh, change three and change four because I've actively written docs. Uh, I've written guides on how this happens, but you can also just ask ChatGPT or Perplexity. They'll read the docs and then tell you how to do this. 
I also want to quickly talk about what the code is actually doing. We've got two API requests. First for a quote response. This is a hard coded API request. What we're doing is we're trading soul. So the input mint is soul and the output mint is USDC. And the amount I've added a zero in here because I don't want to trade too much soul for USDC right now. I'm going to test it. But this is going to give us back a quote response. Once we have the quote response, we're going to use that to make a another API request for a swap. And this is going to give us back the transaction, as I mentioned. So we've got the code response in here. We've got the public key. And this is just wrap and unwrap soul. You can ignore this for now. Once we have that, the rest of it is just a standard transaction serialization and signing flow. This is all over the docs. You can ask chat GPT about this. You can ask perplexity about this and it's going to explain it to you. Or what I really recommend doing is just read the docs. Um, they, 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 they do a decent job at explaining this. If they don't tell me comment down below, I'll, I'll make an explanation on how all this works as well. Let's go. Let's test this out. So you go to localhost slash swap. We've got the big old swap button. And if I open up my terminal, I've got, this is ignorable. This is probably happening from somewhere else. We've got our wallet address coming in here and I'm going to hit swap. And this should open up phantom with a swap request on the mainnet. There we go. Now that we've got the API working, we can move on to the exciting stuff like the UI. I gave chat GPT an image and asked it to generate the base stuff. It did. And a bunch of it was broken and I fixed the rest of it. So I made it look a bit prettier. You're also going to need to decouple some of the functions. So you know how in the previous iteration, we had code and swap happening in the same function. In production, you can't do that uh, because you want the code response to be uh, presented to the user and the swap to be initiated by a button. You're going to need to separate the code function and the uh, swap function. So that's what I did. I've got a get code function over here that just gets the code from the input. So based on what the user has selected, I've got a couple small selections over here. And then once that's done, I've got the send and sign and send transaction. Uh, that's pretty much the exact same code that we had previously. I've also got a bunch of other stuff here for managing the input. So you'll notice when I change the input, uh, the uh, output or yeah, the output is also updated pretty soon. So to do this appropriately, you will need to do something called a debounce. I didn't know what this was. I asked ChatGPT. ChatGPT sorted it out for me. So we've got a bit of a debounce call. This effectively delays the API call until the user has stopped typing. And the rest of it is just handling uh, value changes. So handling the two assets. So this is going to change. This is going to change all of this. Um, yeah, pretty straightforward stuff. And that's it. You're done. Your app is complete. I hope this was helpful. Uh, the code is in the description. You can jump into it. You can fork it. You can manage it. You can make it your own. Uh, if you have any questions, put them in the comments. Uh, if you want more of this stuff, let me know. Good luck.